Good evening, everyone. I'm Ann Hughes, a Director of Development here at UAlbany. And on behalf of the UAlbany Alumni Association, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight for pursuing the pandemic. Undeniably, COVID-19 is deeply impacting our lives. We are pleased to have Dr. Eli Rosenberg with us tonight to share how work being done at UAlbany has contributed to the state and country's knowledge about the extent and implications of COVID-19 infection. Dr. Rosenberg is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health. He is committed to epidemiological infectious disease work to improve the health of people here in New York State and across the country. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping details. In order to give Dr. Rosenberg our undivided attention, we ask that you please keep the discussions in the chat to a minimum. If you do want to ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to be monitoring those and we will take up the questions at the end of the presentation. And it now is my honor to introduce to you, Dr. Eli Rosenberg. Thank you so much for having me and thank you everyone um, uh, for coming tonight. I'm going to just start this up here. Um, great. So uh, I'm here tonight to talk about some of our work uh, uh, done uh, in, in many, in a large part in collaboration with colleagues at the Department of Health and the New York State Department of Health here. Um, but also we'll take a few other uh, side, side steps to, to talk about some other work, including some work going on on campus uh, here at UAlbany. Um, where we're, of course, dealing with COVID-19 locally. Um, and really, as a prelude, I really want to set this up that this is, um, a, a, you know, a team effort and also really a long slog, as many of you, of, of course, can all appreciate. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> I want to just recognize before we even get going here, that New York has seen uh, a lot of highs and lows this year. We've actually seen some big successes getting down this curve here. This is from a screenshot from the governor's presentation through the end of the, of the summer. Obviously, as many people know, we're uh, starting to see increases again in this, um, un unfortunately, um, in, in things as we head into the cold season. So um, this is a long story, um, and we're still writing the story, um, uh, all of us. And uh, what I'm going to largely talk about here is the work from uh, our team at the New Albany School of Public Health. Uh, really embedded within the New York State uh, Department of Health is re response since the really the first week of the pandemic. And, you know, sometimes when I talk about some earlier work and when you see typical research presentations, you'll see this sort of as a very organized research portfolio. I had hypotheses and I did an experiment and it was very straightforward. That is not this presentation. All right, I'm really going to talk about uh, what came to us in real time as the pandemic unfolded. And it's really not an organized research presentation because this is, this is the nature of the game. And really I wanna recognize this is a small piece of a large, a very large portfolio of work that's going on um, at the DOH and of researchers worldwide. And this is just our, our small story and really it was really uh, a, a statewide and a worldwide effort. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about our work um, with UAlbany during the fall. Um, and really, this is just incredible, uh, incredible team. I'm just representing, uh, you know, uh, you know myself, but really, it's the work of so many others as well here. And so, um, I want to just we're going to talk about a lot of different things tonight. And um, I'm, I've sort of organized this uh, through time. And so, uh, I want to talk about uh, our work really early on in March, uh, uh, providing technical assistance in documenting and understanding where, where, and when, and how the epidemic was emerging. Uh, after that period in March, we pivoted towards uh, two very uh, important timely medical investigations. One is on the potential treatment uh, effects of hydroxychloroquine um, in treating COVID-19. I'll talk about our role in that work, as well as an investigation on uh, a, a new uh, mysterious syndrome called multi-system -inflam multi inflammatory system syndrome in children um, that was emerging uh, uh, some weeks later. I'll talk a bit about surveillance and metrics. Um, that's really my background. A lot of my background is in sort of methods for disease surveillance. How do we measure and track diseases? And I'll talk about some of our work done in that area. And I'll talk a little bit as well about sort of the future. Everyone wants to know what's going to happen next week, next month. Uh, and, I'll, and I have some comments there about where we're at right now. And, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A because it's, it's complicated. Uh, and I also want to really want to really want to shine a light that it's you know our work has also you know been really focused locally. Um, 
our team really moved in a large way from our health department work back to University of Albany this fall to support our testing program here on the campus. And I'll give you a little picture of what that's like here. So, you know, the back when um, in, in, the, in the early days of March, we didn't have COVID dashboards. We didn't have the New York Times giving us great pictures every day. We didn't have the, you know, a lot of things. The best way to actually learn about or to really understand what was going on around us right, was to follow the governor's Twitter feed. It's funny to think about it now, but really the governor's day-to-day -day tweets and eventually his press conferences really became a source of, of, of great knowledge. And so on March 1st, uh, the first uh, diagnosed case um, in New York State uh, was made in a returning traveler from Iran. And within a few days, we started to see many other cases. On the, on the second, there was a, 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 a non-traveler who was infected. And with, by the, here by, the Mar by March 6, we're uh, reporting uh, uh, 11, 11 new cases on that day, a total of 44, and really starting to fan out from, from, Westchester, uh, from New York City into the outlying counties of Westchester and Nassau County. And this continued to evolve over the course of the week. And March 7th was a really important day in the, in the history of how this unfolded in New York, because that was the day that the governor declared a state of emergency. And with the state of emergency came um, a number of actions and, and uh, opening of different types of resources. Um, and one of them that was very important on that for our early work was a massive scale up of testing. Um, and testing started to be um, authorized in commercial laboratories, not state laboratories. And this really led to a, a very big ramping up in new in diagnoses that were being made um, all across the state and that would continue through this day. Um, and so here is what one of the, here's, this is the, this is the tweet authorized, talking about the authorization of Northwell's laboratories. Um, um, it's funny to think 75, 80 samples a day, that that was an impressive number given what we do nowadays, um, some just only a few months later. And we see here really by March 9th, um, the number of cases had risen to 142. Now in this period, um, our, uh, our uh, leader of the, one of the leaders of the health department reached out to the School of Public Health here at UAlbany um, with an urgent request for assistance, um, asking for really whoever can come from the School of Public Health um, it was sort of an all hands on deck moment. And that was the weekend that we really assembled a team. Um, it was consisting myself, uh, Professor Udo and their health, uh, health policy management behavior Departy, uh, department and students and staff. And we all went over there. And this was really uh, where we sort of landed was in this period around when the emergency declaration was, um, uh, was made. Um, and this is sort of where, what our first setup looked like here. Um, this is our team um, over at uh, Corning Tower down in downtown Albany. And it really was an all hands on deck uh, situation for, for, quite, for, for really uh, quite those first days and weeks. And uh, we, you know, some of our work was sort of uh, grunt work in a sense when we first started working there because it was really any, everyone grab a task and run with it. One of the most important things early on was protecting the health of nursing home residents. And so we, uh, our first task was well, start calling every nursing home and making sure they're aware of the current situation, new advisories that were going out to protect the health of, of, of uh, nursing home residents and staff um, and so forth. And that was, that was itself uh, quite uh, an endeavor given there's 400 uh, uh, nursing facilities in the state. And uh, next, we started to do things that really uh, uh, built in our strengths. And one was uh, to build a new system to capture all of those um, commercial laboratory results that were coming in. The traditional system for receiving laboratory results had a bit of a time lag and laboratories were being told to also fax their results. And we built a new system to capture that fax data. Um, I'll say that the volume of results that were pouring in um, that we, uh, we, were, we frankly outgrew that within 10 days. It was, we built this nice thing and then it was instantly obsolete um, and we had to go to other methods. That was sort of the first, that, that was sort of the all hands on deck moment. But as time went on, our mission sort of turned to a more scientific mission, um, which is of course uh, what we do here at the School of Public Health is we, you know, we're, we're scientists and we develop uh, studies and, and reports and things like that. And uh, what became very clear early on is that there was all this information coming in to our, to the state health department, but very little uh, evidence was existing in the literature. Um, health departments were, of course, uh, uh, completely consumed with responding to the situation. They're not going to publish scientific analyses of their data. Of course, they got much more uh, important and critical things to do. CDC was almost completely silent during this period. And, and for people that have been following this story, um, 
CDC was really under quite the political thumb at the time. And there was a, I have a lot more I can say about that in another session. Um, the federal government was saying almost lit very little about the extent of what we were seeing. Um, and indeed, really, the epidemiologic literature was very much behind the medical literature, which was starting to report medical clinical details of what was going on. Very little population level of information was coming out. And so we started to build a series of studies and reports that really started to pick apart what was going on in New York to try to inform the rest of the epidemic in the country. Remember, at this time, only Washington state and New York were really emerging as places of concentration. California was a little bit behind, but it was really Washington and, and New York at this time. And so that really began the first series of studies. Um, and uh, this first report documented the emergence of, uh, of COVID-19 um, in New York State during the month of March. This was the first um, peer-reviewed publication in the United States that really showed what was going on. And this, of course, these kind of data and maps are like, you know, it's all over the news now and it's obvious to us, but at the time there were no uh, publications showing what was going on. Um, states were beginning to make available dashboards and websites, but there was really no scientific analyses uh, demonstrating what was going on. Um, so this, this first report presented our test results, the percent positivity, how many results were positive, and the demographic breakdown of those initial cases. So this is um, you know, maybe not incredibly revolutionary, but really was the start of the US um, uh, public health literature on sort of the statewide outbreaks. Uh, very importantly, we added something else, almost as an afterthought, but I frankly think the value of this analysis is growing every day. We also presented data on what was going on in households. Very interestingly, New York at the beginning was, de was deployed field staff to really you know, hit, the neighbor hit the streets and neighborhoods where the outbreak was, was growing, particularly in Westchester and Nassau counties. Household death testing was done, and we, had this, we, had, we, we accumulated very rich data on what was going on in households. And through looking at matching on addresses, we were able to take a look at um, the degree to which entire families uh, living together were becoming infected. Um, and just to show you, a little, just to give you a little sense of here, 57% of persons in households of where cases lived were infected, or 38% of the other people who weren't that first case happened to also be infected. They weren't necessarily symptomatic, but they were infected. And we demonstrated that there was some interesting age patterns in this as well. The younger people in the house um, seemed less likely to be infected. Now, again, that some of these things are common knowledge now, but we're not common knowledge at all. There was only one paper out of China that was showing this um, lower likelihood of younger household members being infected. So this was really some of the first data on what was going on in houses and in children. Um, as, as some of you know, this, this is now very, very important as we think about uh, school-based transmission, how do we open schools safely, what are the risks and all of that. Um, CDC finally published their own analyses of households during the, during the late summer and also found between, between 40 to 50% of household members were becoming infected. This is also very important uh, when we think about um, the importance of contact tracing and how people understand their risk and so forth. People don't realize that a lot of transmission is, in, you know, infections are introduced into households and then there's rapid transmission within the household. So this was another piece of our first report from New York State. Another piece that we came out with shortly thereafter was how do we track the epidemic when there's really not, um, not good testing? And again, if you recall early on, testing was very, very limited, um, right? There was shortages, uh, big lines, big weights, and rationing of tests. So it turns out you can use other really critical data to track what's going on in, in, you know, in, in your state. <laughs> um, we used a, a, a surveillance network built for influenza um, from by CDC in New York called the uh, the ILI Net Influenza Like Illness Network, and we this is uh, people who are coming to outpatient uh, you know providers and emergency departments reporting influenza like symptoms, uh, and typically this is used to monitor the uh, the flu season. However, we it also could can be turned and was turned here in New York and other states since towards the tracking of COVID. Um, as well, which has many symptoms in common with influenza. Um, and in this report, we were able to show how um, indeed influenza-like illness, which is this green line, actually began to rise um, somewhat before COVID-19 diagnoses were showing up. 
um, and was also very was also responding to various closures and things that were happening in New York. So these lines here are showing different measures that happened during the month month of March as we sort of incrementally shut down the state. And so that, so that was sort of a neat way to show how we can use alternative measures to track what was going on. So that was some of our first reports in March. And I want to now pivot to sort of another chapter in our story, which started really in April. Um, and it's really started with, with the tale of hydroxychloroquine, which, you know, for some of you, you may be tired of hearing about this. It's really sort of occupied a lot of the air um, during, during this uh, next period of time. And you know, some people have tracked sort of the, the all of the stories uh, or sort of the whole tale of hydroxychloroquine. This I like this paper, they could have compared it to a pendulum swinging. At first, when it hit the world in late March, it was a miracle drug. Then a bunch of studies came out showing, oh, it's actually potentially very harmful. Maybe it's deadly. And then eventually, the sort of the scientific consensus came back to it being not effective. And I want to talk about our study, which is one of the bullets in here, and sort of where we came into this um, picture. Um, all that's to say, just to bring people up to speed, hydroxychloroquine landed on our radar um, really in, in the, the, the third week of March, when a French study from a very eccentric scientist uh, uh, with the last name Raoult uh, had a st study that seemed to show, and again, a very questionable study, but seemed to show that patients receiving this drug normally for malaria um, uh, seemed to be clearing the virus faster and maybe we're getting healthier faster. And this, again, there's a lot of issues with that study. However, Elon Musk starts tweeting about it, the president, uh, President Trump starts tweeting about it, and lo and behold, the whole uh, clinical world goes bananas. There was an absolute frenzy to distribute and treat people in hospitals, uh, pre predominantly in New York at this time, but really around the country and around the world um, uh, with hydroxychloroquine and very, very thin evidence. But the fact that it was so extensively distributed really speaks to the desperation at the time. I just want to bring, just to show you what, again, this, you know, March might feel like years ago. So just to show you what, what, what I'm talking about here, here's an excerpt of President Trump's remarks on March 19th. Um, I, you know, it's, it's honestly not a very linear set of remarks, but I tried to highlight some of the more salient aspects. Um, he's saying hydroxychloroquine, it's been around for a long time. It's very powerful. If things don't go as planned, it's not going to kill anybody. And the FDA has been so great. They've gone through the approval process. It's been approved. And what he's referring to is an emergency use approval of hydroxychloroquine, which is not approved for that use, be approved for malaria, but now approving it for COVID-19. And it, there's tremendous pro pro promise. The individual states can handle it. They can handle it. The doctors are going to handle it. I think it's going to be going to be great. But the studying is also going to be done. And this is because Tony Fauci insisted that it also be studied, it's not just given out to the population. The studying is going to be done and it's gonna be given out to large groups of people, perhaps in New York and other places. We'll study it there. So we're gonna give it to New York and we're gonna study it because that's where most of the uh, nation's cases in the hospital, in hospitals were at that time. Two days later, uh, Governor Cuomo in his press conference acknowledges, yes, we are receiving a lot of doses of this, 70,000 hydroxychloroquine, 10,000 zith azithromycins, um, uh, zithromaxes are being given to us by the federal government. Um, and we're going we're gonna to get the supply and a trial will start this Tuesday. Um, and so that, this is on Saturday. On Saturday, uh, uh, we get a call from the Department of Health saying, we got to start a study on Tuesday. Um, and that was actually with this uh, study that was being referred to uh, by the governor and, and by President Trump. And the idea here was um, really, this thing is being given out to the entire you know, population. Uh, we need to understand, is this safe? Is this effective? Is this going to work? Uh, we can't just give out a, a drug haphazardly to so many people. Um, and what we came up with was really that there was two ways to think about studying this. One is what we call an observational study. So a non-randomized study to understand the efficacy and safety of this drug as it's being rolled out in real time. So this is happening anyway, we're gonna study what's going on. Meanwhile, uh, 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 randomized clinical trials will be started to, all, to bring higher quality randomized evidence, but it necessarily takes some months longer for trials to be conducted rather than studying what's going on. So I'm gonna just, just uh, describe a little bit what we did for the observational study, which is really was co-led by UAlbany School of Public Health um, and then our colleagues at the Department of Health, NYU uh, worked on the randomized trial. So that became this paper um, in, the, in the Journal of American Medical Association, um, which was really with a, 
also really one of the first large scale studies of hydroxychloroquine and it was done here in New York. Um, and this paper, uh, you know, has, has got a lot of attention and still continues to get a lot of attention in the medical world. Um, and essentially what we were showed here um, was there was no difference in mortality um, in the hospital for patients um, who were receiving hydroxychloroquine. I, I don't have all the gory details in here, but what we did was we studied 1,500 patients who were enrolled in New York City area hospitals in the second half of March and followed them into April and studied their medical records. We requested their medical records, abstracted the data, and analyzed the data to understand what is going on for these people receiving hydroxychloroquine. Are they are they living? Are they are you know are they die? Are they you know they are they surviving better in the hospital? Um, are they having uh, uh, safety issues come up? Hydroxychloroquine is known to cause some heart conditions, uh, principally um, uh, uh, arrhythmias and something called QT prolongation. We wanted to see whether that was happening more often. And I'll say just in this period, the data was really remarkable. 50% of the patients in the New York area hospitals were receiving hydroxychloroquine um, and azithromycin and about another 20% were receiving hydroxychloroquine alone. So 70% of New York area patients were receiving this drug within days of this explosion on Twitter. I mean, that's just uh, remarkable. Um, so all that's to say, when we gathered all these data and analyzed it from, from, from 25 hospital centers in New York, we found no significant differences in mortality. Um, that this number here of 1.35 um, suggests there was actually a 35% higher chance of mortality for patients receiving his hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin compared to neither drug, but it was not statistically significant. So essentially maybe an elevated risk of death and certainly no benefit. Um, uh, similarly for hydroxychloroquine alone, we found no real uh, protective effect, possibly a, again, maybe a harmful effect. So we definitely found no benefit with a suggestion of harm. And that really happened with cardiac outcomes as well. These, these next several lines here show what happened. We've studied cardiac arrest, abnormal um, electrocardiogram findings. And again, we found maybe there, there was no difference, but maybe actually a slightly elevated association of cardiac arrest for pa patients receiving hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, so all that's to say is this, that was, um, this became really an important piece of evidence to show this is maybe not a good idea to be giving this um, to so many patients right now, uh, despite the uh, enthusiasm from the White House for the potential of this drug. I'll say that um, the same weekend that that uh, came out, another large study also from the New York area came out um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And together that the JAMA article that we published uh, on the New York, uh, with New York State Department of Health and then the, uh, the, the New England Journal article from Columbia really became the standard of evidence until um, randomized trials came along several months later. Um, trials came out to show uh, a variety of things. First of all, um, two studies uh, from Minnesota showed that hydroxychloroquine wasn't really useful for what we call pre or post exposure prophylaxis, that if you gave this to someone right before or after their exposed, potential exposure to SARS-CoV-2, that nothing would, that they would, would, they, would it protect them? The answer was no. Um, and three large, in some, in some case, national and international tr randomized trials were stopped early because they showed that hydroxychloroquine had no benefit whatsoever. I think what's important here uh, and sort of the, the, where we fit in is that the, the evidence that we accrued in April and published in the first week of May um, really came out several months before the trial evidence. And that really shows how um, epidemiologic observational studies, while ha they have their imperfections, was really able to fill an important evidence gap in the middle of a pandemic uh, and tried to, and, and until the really sophisticated trial data came out a few months later. Um, so that's uh, sort of where we fit into that. I will say that this, this, you know, this story just kept grinding on in late July, or I, mean, I guess it was, no, it was early July now, sorry. In early July, um, after some of the initial trial evidence came out, another study of similar uh, design to ours came out of Michigan. Um, and it had a very, very strange uh, situation where they found the complete opposite results out of our results from New York. Um, they made a bunch of false claims about our study, but really um, what was most troubling is that, they, uh, that the, the persons in that study 
who were not given the treatment were also, um, frankly, uh, much sicker and, uh, and not receiving any interventions and seemingly in a palliative care situation. They found accordingly that the treated people seem to do much better. And that has to do with other things, these other things that were going on. Why am I mentioning this? Well, uh, very interestingly, this, these authors had a very close collaboration with some advisors at the White House and they applied to the FDA to reinstate the use of hydroxychloroquine for treating, um, for treating COVID-19. That caused a huge outcry with the FDA. Uh, the FDA was sort of sacrificing its credibility and was being politically influenced. Um, and of course, the legacy of this is still playing out as people are, do, are questioning uh, uh, vaccine approvals from the FDA. Here's a little, uh, um, uh, there's some snippets from the President Trump, and here's a, some Washington Post coverage of the White House's influence with this paper. We wrote a response that um, really uh, here from the New York perspective to this paper saying, really setting the record straight so that setting both the scientific record straight and really trying to get the politics um, out of medicine here. So I next want to pivot to, the, to another thing we worked on after hydroxychloroquine wrapped up, which was uh, really we had, I don't know, a few days off and then the next thing came along. And that was really uh, what we called MISC, multi-system multi inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, at the end, at the, uh, end of April, um, uh, England was starting to report a strange new pediatric condition um, seemingly associated with COVID-19. Now the UK was hit a little bit before the United States, if you go back to the timeline of things. And so they had a little bit of a leading edge over New York on seeing things emerge. And what seemed to happen was going on here, these, there were these children that were had, um, had COVID-19, but also having this very uh, strong systemic, system-wide inflammatory condition, some similar to something called toxic shock syndrome and also potentially similar to something called Kawasaki disease. Many of the children also had a lot of uh, gastrointestinal symptoms as well. Very shortly after this, uh, cases of this started to appear in the, in the New, York, uh, New York area. New York State and New York City issued health advisories to please start reporting strange, and strange um, uh, conditions like this in children. And indeed, um, uh, very quickly from, the, from over 100 hospitals in New York started to come in reports uh, uh, of this. Um, again, no one had really understood what the strange condition was, but it appeared to be life-threatening as you'll see several children in the New York area died um, as a result of this condition associated with COVID-19. New York State Department of Health launched an investigation um, into what was going on, um, uh, uh, assisted by the CDC and, and by us at the New Albany School of Public Health. And this became a very interesting, uh, very urgent investigation sort of really, uh, and really a great collaboration between state health department, the federal government and, and, and the University at Albany. That led to this publication in the New England Journal of Medicine documenting the, um, this new condition. Um, and uh, of uh, nearly 200 possible cases that were reported, 99 were included in this analysis. And, and 95 of them um, had a sort of confirmed, really rigorously confirmed laboratory evidence of infection. Um, and this clinical sim 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 situation, and then four had just clinical and uh, epidemiologic evidence. Um, all of the children uh, that, that we studied um, had, had fever, uh, tachycardia, type of uh, fast heart rhythm, GI symptoms. Um, and we were able to demonstrate really the, the, how this illness was manifesting and really interestingly differently by different age groups. So here, just to give you a flavor of what we saw, um, there were more dermatologic symptoms in the younger children, the more myocarditis, so sort of like heart inflammation um, in, uh, in the older children. And so this, uh, we were able to really very quickly investigate and show the rest of the country what was going on. And I'll just say within a few months, there were hundreds of cases nationwide um, that were being documented by CDC. So again, timeliness is really important. This investigation uh, was wrapped up and able to get out to the world very quickly, right ahead of where the rest of the cases in the country started to emerge. Oh, and I forgot to mention here, two children in this investigation um, were deceased, uh, ages zero and 12. And we were able also to pinpoint where this is happening in time following initial infection. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but I'll say that uh, <clears throat> only half of the children had a current infection of SARS-CoV-2, but 100% had essentially evidence at some time beforehand. Um, and when we lined up in time when these cases emerged, 
relative to, uh, to all the general pediatric cases, we noticed that these cases seemed to emerge about a month after uh, pediatric infections uh, were sort of peaking um, in New York. And that really that sort of uh, helped develop the idea that this is a secondary response of the immune system uh, of the and, and secondary inflammatory situation sometime after the initial infection clears. Children get this infection, uh, their body removes it, you know, and then there's a secondary response where their immune system revs up and goes into this very damaging mode. Frankly, uh, fortunately, we found this to be very rare, only two per 100,000 compared to overall pediatric diagnoses being 322 per 100,000. So this was rare, but it seems to be happening very seriously in about a month after diagnosis. So I'll next wanna talk about metrics. So uh, metrics have been very important here as we've been thinking about how the state operates and reopens and all of that good stuff. And we need to, you know, we, it's very, uh, numbers have been so much of this story here. Um, the, if, you, if you think about the uh, initial data, it was about monitoring and projecting hospitalizations and deaths. And over time, it became many other measures to try to understand how safe is it to reopen? How many people are being currently infected and so forth? I just wanna take a short pivot to something, um, to our studies of the cumulative burden of, of infection through antibody testing. Um, if, in, in April, New York, New York State launched the first of two studies in grocery stores that were pretty innovative at the time. And the idea here was to look for something called antibodies to understand um, how, whether somebody had a history of infection beforehand. Uh, 15,000 persons were approached in 99 grocery stores all around the state um, during this period and tested uh, for antibodies. And um, why grocery stores? Well, the simple answer is a lot of the state was shut down. Um, grocery stores seemed like a pretty reliable space to encounter uh, a wide swath of people. Um, that became this analysis in the Annals of Epidemiology that we assisted with. And we were able to document just the sheer extent of transmission of this infection that had occurred um, by, <clears throat> by this period at the end of April. And just to step you through this, we show that 14% of persons in New York State were estimated to be infection from our sample. And that corresponded to about a little over 2 million adults with an experience of infection of, of this virus. And we saw, of course, a regional packet pattern that's very uh, familiar now, right? In concentration in New York City, 23% of New York City uh, uh, residents were estimated to have been infected. Uh, uh, somewhat less in uh, the lower Hudson, Westchester, Rockland, and in Long Island, and then much lower in the rest of New York State at this time. Obviously, this is no longer true, but this is where we were at the time. Um, and I just wanted to, so yeah, that's, uh, I just want to be able to say that this was really uh, the first statewide study of this sort. And we were able to show some things uh, that became very important. We estimated that this meant if you added, look it up, looked up all these infections and how many diagnoses were made relative to these total number of persons, we estimated that only about 9% of infections were diagnosed. And the CDC, again, very late to the game on, on many of these things, wound up coming up with, a, with an estimate of 10% sometime later. We were also able to calculate an infection fatality rate of about 0.6%, so about a, little, about a little over half of 1% of persons infected had died. And indeed, this has held up to be 0.6 seems to be about sort of the magic number uh, for this infection. And again, this aligned with some later studies that came out. Um, and so it's the, I think uh, we were very proud to be able to get this work out. Another important contribution of this work was showing the sheer racial disparities in infection. Again, the people were seeing in the mortality data that there was some differences in race and ethnicity from COVID-19. This was the first study in the US to really show at the infection level what is going on. And indeed, we had sh sh uh, shown that about 29% of Hispanic or Latinos who were studied um, had uh, antibodies or evidence of infection compared to 20% of, of Black African-Americans or non-Hispanic and, non and only 8% of non-Hispanic whites, showing the sheer huge disparities in infection that had emerged in this early period. And again, really the first population study of this and also importantly, if you look at the box on the right, this is how many of the infected New Yorkers belong to that group. So here we're showing 37% of all infections in New York um, were estimated to be among Hispanics or Latinos, despite that group only being 17% of New Yorkers. So that's a huge gap, 17% of the population, 37% of the infections. Again, documenting this huge disparity. Um, 
in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this, this work. We can get back to it later if there's questions. But we did some additional work that dug deeper on those racial ethnic di uh, differences to really understand where are the sources of this, this coming from? Why are people be in dying at such different rates, infected at different rates, and so forth? Um, and that led to a really interesting data synthesis project where we were able to pick apart uh, some of those sources of racial and ethnic disparities, uh, which continue to really mark this epidemic. I'm going to just, again, skip ahead. Uh, another uh, portfolio of work that's really on the work in the works, we have some, one paper on this that's already posted online, is really looking at the intersection of HIV infection and COVID-19 infection. I'm, I'm an HIV researcher uh, by training and by history. And so this is uh, important to people and you know, many colleagues of mine uh, here and, 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 and nationally. And I'll just say, um, it's, it's very unclear whether HIV, uh, which is itself a very, you know, a serious life-threatening infection, um, puts people at increased risk uh, with respect to COVID-19. And this first bullet here, we, it, is the study that I just mentioned that we've, that we've put online, um, is indeed showing that when we, when we put together databases of people living with an HIV diagnosis and those diagnosed or hospitalized with COVID-19, in New York State, there actually does appear to be a significantly higher rate of hospitalization for people who are living with HIV um, and who get COVID-19 compared to those without COVID-19, about a 40% higher hospitalization rates. And this is driving higher mortality from COVID-19 among people living with HIV. And this is that's the first uh, population-based study to really demonstrate what's going on. And this we were able to do this because New York happens to be an epicenter of HIV infection and COVID and has all the data sort of at hand to be able to robustly study this. So um, just to give a few reflections on where, you know, that, that sort of brings me somewhat up to date with where we are research-wise right now. Um, you know, I just wanna talk a little bit about where we're at and where this is going, because I'm tired of this, you're tired of this, we're all tired. Um, and I think what's really been, I've been saying for the past while that we're gonna continue to see uh, waves of infection and really an altered reality until we have a vaccine or highly effective treatments um, that can be administered early for those treatments that, and that, that they would be widely available. Um, that's still true. We're still seeing uh, different gyrations of this all around the country um, because until then we're really reliant on behavioral and social strategies, right? Distancing, masks, and so forth. Um, in a population that's really tired of this, we're weary and also unfortunately wary, right? There's a lot of mistrust and uh, disinformation going around around the efficacy of masks um, around a, a, lot of, a lot of pieces of this. And that unfortunately uh, means we're having a very difficult time controlling this. The other thing that we uh, desperately need and has to do with our lack of control is the lack of federal coordination. Um, it's been interesting to see that you know uh, Tony Fauci uh, came out with a statement yesterday saying, "Oh, we need federal coordination of this," and now it's become a news meme of the last few of the last day or two. Uh, but this has been the problem since the beginning. States were sort of abandoned um, uh, to figure this out individually on their own without a strong federal government response, and that has led to um, different places doing pursuing different strategies and peaking and ebbing and flowing at different times making this almost impossible to control as a country. Um, and that's, that's extremely unfortunate and really a, in a large way, uh, a, a part of what's going on. So we need an alignment of political strategies and public health strategies. And really, like I said here, this is really a national tragedy that we haven't had this. We need an alignment of our testing and contact tracing efforts and the supply chains that support testing. Uh, and of course, we need federal coordination of treatment and vaccine research, and that's been happening more. This, this slide is a, it's a little bit old, but it's obviously that we've seen some coordination of that. What we've seen very poor federal coordination of is everything that happens um, after the vaccines are uh, uh, licensed and, and approved, um, the supply chain um, and how to implement those appropriately. I think New York State will continue to lead in these areas. We emerged as sort of a national leader early on. We have a very robust um, uh, Department of Health um, and everyone's tired, um, but I think New York will continue to emerge here as a leader. I just wanna comment a little bit on that, um, on, on the vaccines. Um, as many know, we've seen the last uh, two weeks have seen the emergence of two very effective uh, <clears throat> 
vaccine, one was from Pfizer and one from Moderna, 95% of infections be able to be prevented by these two vaccines. Uh, but it's really important to recognize that that is real, that's a, an amazing accomplishment of science. We've compressed years into months. However, that's really just the first challenge. Right? This, the next challenge is this wide scale, rapid distribution of this, vi of this vaccine. Um, at a, at a, in a, uh, a vaccines that are really a, of a new class of vaccines that have never been scaled like this before. Um, they require cold distribution, particularly the Pfizer vaccine, which has to be extremely cold. Um, and of course, you need to have a network for that distribution and storage, and, and of course, getting it to the people, administering that um, to the entire population. Not only that, we need to do it twice, right? We have two doses for each of these. So that's, that's really, that's an, a lot. Imagine you have to get back to everyone three weeks later, this is this, frankly, all of this means it's harder than testing. Right? We haven't even tested the whole state. Now we're talking about putting two doses of vaccine into everyone in the state. That's a huge, huge scale of difference. Um, and of course, we're doing this at a time when our system is already so strained and underfunded, right? So it's strained in responding to this and we just don't have the funding or the staffing power um, at the moment truly to, to really pull this off well as a country. And of course, the other battle that we're fighting is vaccine hesitancy, right? That, that we have a political environment now um, uh, uh, around the whole federal response, right? Um, and uh, that's not helping um, and, 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 and sowing doubt. Uh, the speed of the vaccine development process itself, while amazing, has also uh, sowed doubt. Do we have enough time to understand safety, right? Have we only followed people for two months is the, you know, two months is the um, length of time that safety is being tracked before approval from the FDA of these drugs, right? And so, and of course, there's uh, deep histories uh, in, in many in many in many communities, uh, particularly uh, communities of color, ar that uh, around distrust. There's a deep history and reasons for distrust of government and as it pertains to to treatments. And so, it was a huge it was a huge hurdle to overcome. The most effective vaccine won't be useful if no one will take it. So um, I think an, you know, an important step that was taken earlier, early on in September was as Governor Cuomo has decided, well, we're going to add an additional layer to help build that trust in two committees, one looking at safety and efficacy of those drugs, and the other looking at distribution implementation. That's one that I'm uh, privileged to be a part of. These are not meant to uh, question or doubt the federal approvals process. I think there are really tools to help build the public's trust, given a damaged trust in the federal government. So my last thing that I wanna comment on, knowing that we're really coming up on our time, is I wanna talk about the UAlbany Surveillance Testing Program. I just told you a lot about the federal response, the state and all of that, but what are we doing here at UAlbany? Um, and this, these are some screenshots of what's really become an important tool here at UAlbany in our ability to understand the epidemic and stay open. And I'll talk a little bit about our recent pause. Um, but the testing program here that we've been able to operate in collaboration with the uh, RNA Institute has been really fantastic. And this idea here, and you can see some pictures, is that it's a self-collected uh, tube of saliva. You spit in the tube, nothing up your nose. Um, uh, and it's a testing program that we've been able to deploy to help control the epidemic on our, on our own campus. Here's President Rodriguez um, uh, uh, showing off his UAlbany mask, but also this really great collection box where he's dropping his tube into. And here's a TikTok video from an enthusiastic student explaining all the steps that were involved in sort of spitting in your tube, putting it in the bag, drop it in the box. It's a pretty easy system and very different, frankly, than how a lot of the other campuses have been doing this. Ours, I truly, I think, is one of the easiest uh, testing programs around in the country. Here's just a screenshot of some of the data online that is posted every day from our testing program. Over 32,000 specimens have been tested this semester, and we've seen 359 come back positive. Um, and what is this program? Here's a little more of the details. Um, this is really a, a really great collaboration between the RNA Institute, a fantastic um, uh, basic science uh, uh, la uh, laboratory on our campus, and us at the School of Public Health. We all put our research teams together to really pull this off on the lab end and on the field operations end. Um, and the idea here is, again, that it, it became really recognized in the summer that campuses were going to have to screen their students and staff a lot. Uh, for asymptomatic infections, you know, infections that are not showing symptoms, as an important tool to keep the campuses open. Um, and um, 
this was initially this was implemented as follows: basically, people spit into tubes, they drop them off in their box in the box, and then we analyze them at the laboratory together in groups of four. And if one of them is positive, the whole group has to be individually tested. And this initially started um, as a program that happened once a month, and we uh, very quickly ramped up to weekly testing where we are right now. Um, and I'll say that there's been a, a lot of fascinating data and you know and results from this program. We, we were able to catch 359 uh, asymptomatic infections in those over those 330,000 tests. And these early detections likely prevent, prevented many more downstream infections as people walked around and transmitted to others. So it seems like a big number, but it actually means we prevented a whole lot more um, as well. Many other SUNY campuses had to go on pause uh, because they didn't have these kinds of tools, but rather traditional symptom-based test diagnostic testing. And so some other campuses uh, wound up pausing in September and October. You Albany had a spike in September that we were able to control with very aggressive testing. Um, uh, for, for those that have been following, U Albany is now in a state of pause through November, uh, uh, sorry, beginning in early November, after a large spike in infections was, was detected in this program. Now these were asymptomatic infections, not symptom-based that would have been discovered sometime later, probably a week or two once we had a much bigger problem. Um, this was really an early detection that led to a smarter closure of the campus before things got worse. Now what we're seeing a week or two later is many other campuses in the region or the state that don't have uh, such coverage of testing are indeed seeing problems and are moving towards closure. So again, this is, has become a very important tool and one that let us at least uh, uh, operate successfully in person during September and October. So I'm gonna stop there. I know that's, been, that's a lot of information delivered. Um, I just wanna say that of course this is, you know, uh, there's so many people that are involved in this work here at the School of Public Health. This is just a fraction of those names. Here's a fraction of the names at the health department on the other end, providing exceptional leadership. And I really wanna say again that, this, that um, so much of what I've described here is not, would not be any remotely possible without the dedicated staff from the Department of Health here in Albany and statewide who have given months of their lives to this. Um, and with that, I'm going to pause. And you're on mute. There we go. Thank you, Eli. You, you really provided uh, so much wonderful and important information tonight. Uh, we have a couple questions that we want to get to, but but I have one that I'd like to start with because I know that you've done so much work and the teams that you've been involved with have as well. Yeah. Some of these are projects that would take months, if not years, to complete. Can you give us a little perspective on like just the speed uh, and, yeah. and the amount of work that needed to be done to go from a time in March when we knew basically nothing to the point that we're at now? Yeah, it's incredible and hard to, it's, it, yes, absolutely. Um, the speed of everything is sped up um, in the scientific community right now. And I'll just give an example from the hydroxychloroquine work where we went from, you know, Trump says, I'm, I'm sending drugs to New York to, you know, the study done in six weeks, right? How does that happen? Um, one is uh, uh, really uh, just, I mean, just the dedication of people and working around the clock. So that's just huge, pure elbow grease. Um, some of it, like, again, we had medical abstractors working seven days a week in shifts. We're abstracting medical charts. Then we, once the data was in, we were working in really shift work around the clock analyzing data, the peer review process with journals has been markedly sped up. The, you know, JAMA um, had comments on our paper in days in review processes that normally would have taken weeks. Um, so the speed of science and publication has also been really sped up. So I'll say um, that has had a human toll. I think people are very much burned out across the public health community right now. And that's one of the reasons that I'm very worried about next year when the vaccine challenge will be very huge and People just gave everything, gave it everything in the spring and the summer of 2020. Considering how complex um, the whole vaccine process and distribution will be, can you give us any kind of time frame where it might be widely available? That's a great question. It's you know, I, I it involves things that really I'm not almost privy to. Right, I don't. I, it's like because you have drug companies making promises that are just re of remarkable, you know, volumes of drug going out. Um, and, um, and of course, infrastructure around the state. I do think realistically what I tell people is it's, you know, uh, the timelines of spring and summer for the, uh, you know, for the average 
the average Joe or Jane is just not realistic um, in terms of what we have to put in place and the volume of drug that has of vaccine that has to be distributed. Um, you know, maybe some priority groups, you know, the most vulnerable and the and most essential of workers will go first. But I think widespread vaccination to the level of where, okay, we don't need masks anymore because we have such a, you know, so many people are vaccinated. Nah, -uh. not the rest of 2021. I think um, all of the other measures and in terms of our personal behavior and what's going on in the community, closures and all those disruptions, um, that's going to be a part of our life until a huge amount of the population can be vaccinated. And that's going to be most, you know, late next year if we're lucky. Well, well we're in for the long yep. haul, aren't we? Getting back to those studies, we have a question. Uh, it says, from whom were you able to secure funding for those early studies? Um, sure. So uh, the early studies were done on, uh, were really sponsored by the Department of Health. So in, uh, you know, our work here at UAlbany was unpaid. Um, and really, you know, we had existing research relationships and other old funding and you know, ways that we all learned and had staff to work together. So people were diverted from projects um, and some existing contracts that the state had were able to be leveraged to get those data. Um, truly, uh, it was sort of a time when uh, new funding for this was not, an, was not an option and really not even uh, talked about. All right, I have a question now about health disparities. Uh, are the disparities in infection related more to underrepresented minorities working as essential workers? That's a great question. That was definitely one of the early hypotheses. Um, and I don't think it's really panned out. You know, I haven't followed this. You know, first of all, there's, there were a number of studies done in, the, in sort of the essential workers of New York, some of the, by, by New York State. They'd launched various antibody studies and we're actually showing that a lot of like, particularly the healthcare workers were often um, healthier than community members, community members at large, because they had robust access often, not always to, to personal protective equipment. Um, we were exercising very safe protocols. Um, I, I think it truly uh, is probably more likely tied to uh, housing density, reliance on public transit um, uh, and family size. Um, all of those things like household transmission is a very important piece of this. Um, and I think sort of this, the more tight knit a community is, is actually unfortunately uh, much more tricky uh, uh, in terms of infectious disease spread. It's been true forever, um, in, you know, back to tuberculosis in New York City 100 years ago. Great to know that you Albany is playing a role in, in getting behind those health disparities and really getting to the bottom of this. Um, all right, we have a question about the saliva test. Uh, will the saliva test be available in other states to track asymptomatic cases on campuses or schools? Great question. So, um, so a number of universities this summer pushed out their own versions of this protocol. Both Yale and University of Illinois were really at the forefront of this. And actually the UAlbany protocol is um, a hybrid of both of those, what those two universities did. Um, Yale um, has moved to commercialize and sell their saliva test um, in various ways. I believe the NBA is a major client of theirs. Um, another uh, a saliva based test that you may have seen in the news is coming from SUNY Upstate Medical Center. They're providing the testing that's also a saliva based test to all of the SUNYs and they're also pursuing commercialization. Um, their test is like a mouth swab and not a spit thing. So it's a little more complicated. Um, uh, but at UAlbany, we've decided to sort of take a, a smaller is better approach um, in that we're get that in order to have a very rapid and nimble program, we get our, you know, we get our results far ahead of the other SUNY campuses and time is everything here. Uh, in order to keep it small and manageable, uh, the RNA Institute has opted to sort of not pursue the uh, commercialization and getting this outwards. Um, here, here's another question. Do you have specific study plans to track the uptake and efficacy of the vaccine rollout in the New York State population? Seems like there would be some complex uh, modeling opportunities, tracking rates of infection, rates of vaccine uptake, vaccine yep. hesitancy, and the continuation of protective measures like mask wearing and social distancing. That's a, oh, method. That's like 20 studies right there. Wow. <laughs> so some of the, yeah, I want, I want all of that. Um, the question is right. The, the staff power, um, you know, it, it really, because a lot of those studies have to be conducted by the state to get the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, 
So uh, a, a lot of vaccine data is going to be routinely collected. The, the state operates existing data systems uh, for around vaccination. So there'll be very good tracking of who's getting vaccinated and how and which communities and, and completion rates and all of that. There's existing databases that will be enhanced. The rest of those behavioral pieces, honestly, I wish we had better data. We don't have good estimates of uh, all the opinions and trends and behavior, you know, all of that, the sort of softer stuff besides receipt of vaccine. How, what are people doing with masks now? How do they feel about vaccine today in these different communities? I wish we had better data on the pulse of things. Um, and it's gonna be really important in the next year. I, I totally agree. The problem is, is that the community of re people to collect these data is so stretched right now. The public health workforce is um, much smaller than you'd think, uh, unfortunately. All right, uh, what are your thoughts, Dr. Rosenberg, on uh, why people with HIV would have a higher risk of COVID-19 as compared to those with other pre-existing conditions? Huh. Okay, so great question. So just to, to pick apart, I didn't, and again, I didn't show the data today. So what we found is actually there was not a difference in the level of diagnosis of COVID-19. So acquiring an infection and then going and getting diagnosed was actually the same after we adjusted for a few important factors, right? So people with HIV, um, just by the numbers, tend to be older, more male, live in the New York City area of the state, and be of, rac of a racial minority group. All of those are risk factors for COVID-19. So you have to adjust for all of these things that are common denominators to both infections. After you do that, there's actually no elevated risk of infection, where the elevated risk is in developing severe disease that requires hospitalization. And so given you're, you have HIV and then you get COVID, the consequences are much worse. Possible mechanisms for that, frankly, aren't known. Um, this is really one of the first studies to show it. So I think um, there's, a, there's a, a number of potential you know, ideas. Right? First of all, HIV, chronic HIV infection just weakens your immune system generally. That it is a, by definition, an, an infection of your immune system. So the degradation of the immune system and constantly through the depletion of key cells, fighting a virus constantly renders your body uh, less able to fight a new, a new infection that comes along. So that's definitely a part of it. And we studied um, the relationship between how well your HIV was controlled and, and there's, basically people that are doing worse with their HIV do worse with COVID-19 is what we we're able to show. So there's definitely a piece of that, but there's many mysteries still to be solved there. We don't know. Um, all we know is that it led to more hospitalization and ultimately more death, um, unfortunately. So um, deaths amongst person, among persons with HIV went radically up this spring um, in New York state, unfortunately, because of COVID-19. Okay. Um, Eli, I'm gonna switch it to uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming right. up. You know, the governor has issued his strong recommendations uh, about gathering sizes, et cetera. The CDC came out today with yep. uh, guidelines urging people not to travel. Um, bring it home for us. What, what's your take and what's your advice? I think we should go further, um, I, unfortunately. So I think uh, the CDC is newly liberated after the election, which is um, nice to see that they could come out with stronger guidance. It, under a different uh, administration, they would have said what they're saying now a month ago. Um, and, um, and I think it, we, we, it's, it's important. I think people need to not travel, right? People need to stay close. And even, even small gatherings, or right, that's sort of the, one of the new things of the day, even small gatherings are risky, right? If you have multiple, you know, two or three families come together, um, that can have disastrous consequences. Um, even though it doesn't feel like a lot. It's not going to a, a stadium full of people, right? So you feel like, what's the risk? Well, right now there's so many infections out there in the world. A few families coming together poses quite a large risk actually, right? If you imagine you have a few families and maybe only a few people are going out to here or there or going to a restaurant or whatever, the amount of collective exposure of that group, all the people in those groups spending all the time together is actually quite, can be, you can show mathematically it's quite remarkable. So there, even small settings can pose a huge risk, but this is unfortunately a time that we need to move towards lockdown. I hate to say it. Um, and it's like a toxic third rail word. The fact is the data right now support a very dire time for this country. And that we need to have much more aggressive measures than anyone's willing to stomach. We're already seeing as the cases rise, some different restrictions come up. Uh, the schools in New York City just went uh, remote this week. Yeah. Um, do you see another widespread shutdown coming for New York State? 
uh, Liz, it feels as do I see it happening versus what's needed, right? So I want to, you know, I'm so I, I'm I'm going to stay off the political aspect of that because, right? Obviously, there's a lot of pressure to to keep things open for from so many constituencies, right? I think the science tells us like that the closures in New York in March worked. They did. I mean, the fact is within three, four weeks, we, we did bend the curve and came right back down after the second week of April. Um, and so, and that was a direct, that was a direct result of very aggressive actions in the state. Um, and I do think that we are unfortunately, you know, getting back to a place where we're going to need, we're going to need some more aggressive actions. It's hard to see where reliance on a personal choice and behavior and appealing to, to, that, to those alone is going to work. Um, because that's where, that's what got us to where we are right now. Um, New York has, I think, did a great, we, we did a great job. People in the state did an incredible job keeping this at bay, you know, uh, in the summer. Uh, but the seasons have changed. Uh, people are tired and the story is changing. And so I do think that additional measures are going to be needed. Mm -hmm. I think so many of us just feel like we are helpless individuals here. But, but maybe as we wrap up, uh, you can just remind us, what are the most important things that we can each be doing? Um, okay, so I think clearly, I mean, I think it's, I'd hate to say it, but it's like the, the distance, where, you know, distances and masks and all of that, right? Like limiting your exposure is the most important thing you can do. Um, unfortunately, I think we're seeing in many cases now that this, the amount of infection is, is maybe is so great in communities that that's not enough. Just as an example, my kids, you know, um, uh, we're going to school, wearing a mask, desk six feet apart here in Albany, our school, the kids' school just shut down, right? And but we were doing everything right. So what happened there, right? I think that points to important other measures of actually that right now we're coming to a point where we need to stay home a lot. Um, and that actually even other mingling is just too risky of an environment right now. So I think limiting the number of people that we're contacting with in indoor settings is gonna be an important piece um, in this next period. And that it's gonna mean dampening a, a holiday plans, unfortunately. All right, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, we did get just a couple more questions in and I wanna make sure that we get to those. Um, sure. So we require a new flu shot each year because the virus morphs somewhat each year. What are your thoughts on whether we would need to uh, require a new COVID-19 vaccine every year? Uh, I think at this point, that's an unlikely, um, that's unlikely. Um, get, you know, the reason we have different flu shots every year is because the rate of the mutation of, mutation of, of, of the influenza virus means we are actually getting uh, distinct enough strains that last year's vaccine ain't gonna work this year. And what we know from the rate of mutation of this virus is that it's probably not gonna work on these annual cycles where next year you get a different thing. That one, that this really might go away or really lurk very low after we have enough vaccine. Maybe there will be a different version that emerges in some time. Remember, this is SARS-CoV-2. There was a SARS-CoV-1, right? In the 2000, early 2000s, right? So this can reemerge. Um, but I don't think it's going to be the annual uh, plague that is influenza. All right, we have kind of a general question here. I'll let you uh, take it in the direction you'd like to. Any thoughts on contact tracing? Um, uh, well, interest. Okay, that's that's a hard way. Any thoughts on contact tracing? I think uh, it's actually. I was just. I just uh, had an interview where I was trying to talk people through the double-edged problem of contact tracing. It's an essential tool. Um, and it's been, you know, I come from HIV and sexually transmitted infections. Contact tracing is bread and butter disease control. Um, and it's important to being able to track down what's going on. Uh, that being said, um, it's, it's only going to be so successful. First of all, it has to be done timely. And if that, we got to get to people faster than we're getting to them now. So I think that's a challenge. But the second piece is, as, as we have more of these transmissions from sort of house, let's say the household gathering situation of, you know, we had a few families come together and, you know, I don't have that many contacts or even I, I, I stay home all day. Let's imagine this, I stay home all day. I don't go anywhere, but I live with one person who goes somewhere. They get infected, they never develop symptoms and then I get sick and I get symptoms and I'm the one who gets diagnosed. The contact tracer calls me and they're like, who do you see? And I'm like, I see the people in my house, right? And this is happening more and more. If you're following what's going on in Albany County, we're having a lot of situations where people have no contacts or have nothing meaningfully to contribute. And that demonstrates how the asymptomatic and household transmission aspects of this 
really can frustrate contact tracing where it looks like people have no contacts. And so um, it's an important tool, but it's not gonna do everything when we're having all this sort of small scale transmission. And you can't easily say, oh yeah, I went to the rally. That's why I'm infected, <laughs> you know? Um, and that it becomes harder and harder. So it's one tool, but not gonna be everything. Okay, but a very important one as long as, uh, as, long as we do have it. Yep. All right, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, I can't thank you enough for all the work that you've been doing and that I know you'll continue to do for sharing it with us tonight and for all that you do for the school and for the university. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're so lucky to have you. Uh, everyone, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this very educational presentation and I really wanna wish you good health and a very happy Thanksgiving. Have a good night.